Good morning. I'm Jillian Black, and welcome to the Department of Family and Support Services, Reducing Risk for Girls in the Juvenile Justice System, also known as GEMS RFP. Joining me today is Lisa Hampton, Director of Prevention and Intervention, as well as Rosanna Riley Brown, Youth Services Coordinator in our Youth Services Department. Just a few, few housekeeping rules. Due to the value of participants, everyone has been placed on mute. Please submit questions via the question box and we'll respond to questions at the midpoint and end of the presentation. <laughs> Please use the question box to notify us of any technical issues. Please be advised this webinar is being recorded. Anything stated at this webinar is not intended to change the solicitation document. Any changes will be in writing in the form of an addendum issued by the Department of Family and Support Services. The purpose of this webinar is to provide information for the solicitation. A copy of the recording will be posted on the DFSS YouTube channel with a link and a re recording and a PDF of the PowerPoint slides will also be provided. DFSS retains the right to share a list of registrants to this webinar along with their contact and organizational information at our discretion. Now I'll hand it over to the program team. Please feel free to take it away. Good morning and thank you, Jillian. Um, once again, I'm Lisa Hampton. I'm the director of the Prevention and Intervention Portfolio, and I'm going to run through um, the RFP for the GEMS program or girls um, at, in the juvenile justice system. Um, so the purpose of the RFP is that we are seeking one provider to implement evidence-based one-on-one intervention programming for 100 self-identified girls ages 10 to 17 in the justice system or at risk of justice involvement in the city of Chicago. This intervention should aim to reduce their risk factors for further involvement in the justice system, juvenile justice system and services should be culturally appropriate and gender responsive. Um, we hope the intervention will lead girls on a path towards success, safety and stability. And one-on-one -on -one sessions are aimed to increase healthy relationship, healthy relationship, sexism, bias, safety planning, building trust with an adult and addressing familiar challenges. This is not a mental health program. Interventions can be one-on-one -on -one, um, and if needed in a group setting. It will also have a capstone project that's attached to this as well as up to three months of follow-up services. Um, and we will get into more detail into those areas as well. So um, one of the first things we wanna say is give some background as to our GEMS grant. Um, in 2021, DFSS was awarded a federal grant from the U.S. Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, which we'll refer to often today, and that was aimed at reducing the risk of girls in the justice system. There are three um, parts to this RFP, one being training for stakeholders, which is handled by DFSS staff. Two is working with Cook County Probation on gender responsive assessment tools, which was also handled by DFSS staff. And the third part of this grant is the piece that we are RFPing today, which is the intervention services for girls. Um, this RFP aims to address um, one of the key strategies in that grant, which again is, which is our GEMS program or Girls Empowerment Motivation Series. Um, and it is to implement evidence-based direct services for girls on probation, parole, or at risk of juvenile involvement. I do want to acknowledge that one of our key partners in this RFP, as well as our entire grant, is Cook County Juvenile Probation and Court Services, which the individual who's working, um, who's awarded this award will have to work very closely with in order to be successful in this program. We want to give a little bit of background. And once again, I will just say that this webinar is just to highlight some key things that we want you to take away. But it is your responsibility as an applicant for you to actually read the entire RFP. 
and to acknowledge what are all the requirements and parts that you will need to address in your application question. So please do not use this webinar alone as the only way for you to understand what's going on in the um, and what we are asking for and seeking as an applicant. Please make sure that you read the entire RFP and particularly the background information as well as what are the priorities. This is just a snapshot of some of the things that are listed in the RFP on pages four through 10 of the RFP. This is just a little bit of the background as we talk about girls in the justice system and why we wanna focus on young women. What we know about girls in the justice system is that they are um, consistently a growing population and growing significantly faster in the justice system, more so um, than their counterparts. Um, they have a significant history of trauma, and other adverse childhood experiences, more so than boys um, who are in the justice system and often receive harsher punishments and, um, for lower level crimes. Um, in addition to that, officials from Cook County Juvenile Probation state there are significant racial disparities among youth involved in the juvenile justice system across Cook County, particularly and these extend across gender to further exasperate negative outcomes for girls. The second piece we just want to reiterate is the uh, making sure that the applicant has a key understanding about gender-based violence as it relates to programming potentially here. Um, research consistently finds that girls involved in the juvenile justice system are characterized by life circumstances, personal experiences, and risk factors that are distinct from those of boys in the system. And in particular, they're more like they're four times more likely to have been sexually abused. Um, while males are more likely to commit serious violent offenses than girls, girls are more likely to have committed violent offenses in response to a domestic violence situation. The other piece that I want to reiterate is also lastly the racial disparities in girls in this system. As we've noted already, we recognize that particularly Black girls are entering the justice system at a much higher rate than their counterparts. Um, and part of this is due to this idea of adultification um, that is very heavily laid out within the RFP. This is a general and a very large concept of the background work of our work that we're dealing with as we talk about girls in the justice system here. Next slide. Um, so we want to do a little bit about current state of priorities for improvement. So once again, we're looking to serve 100 self-identified girls um, and this is just a snapshot of what we know from the um, juvenile court and probation services as to where young people are as it relates to data from 2023. Um, currently, there are 179 girls on probation in Cook County. Of those 179 girls, more than 50% are concentrated in 12 zip codes in the city of Chicago. We state this and have this slide here, one, because this is a one provider that we are seeking to serve citywide, but we want them to understand that there's a concentration of young women in certain zip codes and to be able to have a strategy in order to recruit and retain young women from those top 12 zip codes. Next slide. So what are some of the current other priorities that we want um, an applicant to think about is that this, this is a gender responsive approach to work. So I want to reiterate that if this is if you've never done gender based or responsive programming or programming particularly for young women, it is not as simply as taking a program that you currently do for young men and just making it for young girls. That's not what we're seeking in applicants. We want to know that they have a history and an approach that is gender responsive, that is evidence based, and in addition is trauma informed, culturally appropriate supports services and connections, and that the applicant has a knowledge of the juvenile justice system. Um, for the gender responsive approach, we want to, once again, all of these things are highlighted in the RFP in much detail. Um, but any programming as it relates to being a gender responsive approach has to be relational, restorative, social, culturally relevant, and intersectional, um, individualized, multi-level, community-based, strength-based or empowering, and has a concept of safe or safety. Our evidence-based curriculum that we will be using is Peace Over Violence, Be Strong from the Inside Out. This is an acid-based development model that builds on concepts like womanhood, relationships, positive um, respect, positive relationships, and safety. Next slide. Our target population for this RFP is 100 self-identified girls, age 10 to 17 in the justice system. 
are at risk. We want to take a moment, one, to, def to figure out what defining girls in the context means. There's also, this is under your current state of priorities from the improvements that's listed in your RFP starting at page four. We want to ensure that this is a culturally competent and relevant program, given that we're allowing young people to identify and to find themselves in relation to their sexuality or their gender for this, um, for this opportunity. So defining girls in the context of the justice system typically refers to individuals who are biologically female and are involved in the criminal justice system or legal proceedings. However, it is important to recognize that the definition of girls within the justice system should consider more than the biological sex, but closely related to gender identity. Gender is social and cultural. If you, it's how you identify related to society's ideas of what it means to be a woman, a man, neither nor a mix of many genders. We just wanna point that out because whoever assumes the role of being or the awardee here has to be able to serve young people and how they define themselves um, in relation to that. So we just want to elevate that as we move through this entire RFP webinar. Next slide. I wanna take a moment to do some program requirement overview. These are all of the things that you'll need to address in your application in much detail to help us understand that you understand the program that we are trying to implement and also what it means for young women. Um, so one-on-one -on -one season sessions or interventions. We are calling these sessions or interventions because once again, this is not counseling. This is not mental health services. But we want individuals to build a relationship with young women that builds a sense of trust, that they're able to leverage the Be Strong curriculum in order to support those interventions and to help support them as they move through either the juvenile justice system or at risk of involvement in the juvenile justice system. So we are looking for you to serve girls 10 to 17 who are in the justice system or at risk, have a minute, which is a minimum of 15 hours of the intervention up to three months. Um, there will be a pre and post survey that you will need to have the young person complete. So we understand that what is their growth or what is their change over time based on these interventions with an advocate. In addition to that, we're strong, we would like it, young women to um, complete at the end of the three months of intervention services, a capstone project. There's more information about what we, well, how we define a capstone project, what involves a capstone project in the RFP under program requirements section, but capstone projects can be completed individually or as a group by young women who completed their one-on-one -on -one interventions during the three months. In addition, you must be able to do transition planning, which should occur at the end of the three months and should be in partnership with probation or the Illinois Department of Juvenile Justice if the young person is under supervision or a community-based partner to ensure that young people have some support as a, um, as a you know, in addition to what's community-based. Um, this post-intervention services can be up to three months. It is optional and it is up to the young person to decide if they need a little bit more support in order to transition. That might be connecting to activities and services, things such around safety, whether they need ongoing support related to housing um, or safety planning um, or interventions related to school. Lastly, we have um, recruitment and staffing. Um, recruitment, we'll get a little bit more into, but this list is not exhaustive. This is just the tip of the iceberg. We know that young women often are in um, hidden in plain sight. And so we're looking for individuals to have a robust and innovative plan on how they're going to be able to identify young women who can benefit from the one-on-one -on -one intervention. And lastly, staffing. Um, this program calls for one program manager and two advocates or associates that will work individually, that will work directly with the young women in this program. We also, we also want to acknowledge that people should consider a part-time outreach or recruitment specialist who can help with recruitment for young women for the program. Once again, this list is not exhaustive. It is just a small list of individuals that we hope and know that um, have populations that are able to identify and be, el and be eligible for this programming. Um, our main program a partner in this initiative and throughout the grants is the Cook County Juvenile Probation. So working with pretrial probation officers um, to be able to, um, in particular, they have staff at Cook County Probation that are human trafficking specialists from Cook County who, are gonna, who will be a great source of um, referrals and also support and learning for staff. 
the Illinois Department of Juvenile Justice. This is for young people who are at the state level, who they're on parole and who are going to be able to provide, who are returning to community. So for those young women who are returning to the city of Chicago, there, this is an opportunity for you to connect to services on this with this um, Illinois Department of Juvenile Justice. Chicago Public Schools Resource Officers. Um, oftentimes what we know based on research is that school is actually the number one place where we are seeing girls unfortunately entering the juvenile justice system because of the connection related to school um, behaviors. Oftentimes in as as most of the data has indicated in relation to trauma and or violence that's happening to them. Um, so girls in CPS should be considered if they are not currently enrolled in the following programs, CPS mentoring, choose to change or back to our future. Applicants should have a strategy for working with CPS Youth Division, that's their college success post-secondary unit, as well as students living in temporary situations or youth that are um, homeless, unhoused or couch surfing. And lastly, but not, not limited, DFSS programming ourselves. As a member of the youth division, we have tons of programs where it's very obvious that girls may need a little bit more support in order to be successful, um, or that they may be having other challenges that are impacting their ability to be successful in other programs. So applicants should be able to address how they're going to do recruitment with the, if they are a current DFSS provider or with their current programming that they have in place or with any of the options listed below that cover our youth division, our workforce division, and our homeless division, which includes children's services as well, as it relates to young, to, to young women who may have children. Next slide. Program requirements and staffing. One of the things that we want to point out once again is that you can hire a mixture of any of the following, a part-time program manager and two advocates or case managers. The advocates and or case managers um, are, are going to be the individuals who are going to be working directly with a young person. So we'll start there, which is that is the one-on-one -on -one intervention services. They will communicate with juvenile justice stakeholders. We assume that they will assist in the development of the capstone projects to ensure that young women need and have all the resources they need to make those capstone projects work. Um, they'll complete the transition plan and post in our, um, post intervention supports as needed. And once again, I just want to reiterate, it's three months of intervention work and then up to three months of programming um, that a young woman can engage with. And if applicable, attend court with the youth and engage with family guardians as needed. For the program manager, we um, they will have the most contact with DFSS staff. They will meet with us monthly to ensure that they are meeting all of the needs of this grant, as well as um, support in an outreach role and attend any other related meetings to the success of this program. As I stated earlier, DFSS has a strong relationship with our with um, Cook County Probation, um, which has human trafficking staff that um, we, we know that this um, potential delegate will need to engage with as well as our own gender-based violence unit, who is very much um, working with us to ensure that we're meeting the safety needs of young women who come through this program. There are several performance outcomes um, that have been um, developed by OJJDP for this program. So I'm not gonna walk through all of them, but any um, applicant who applies needs to be able to show and to demonstrate that they're able to one, collect this information, whether that's through surveys or through support through DFSS as, um, to help us think about what's the best way for us to capture this data and also have the means in order to capture this data. We will not be using, we will be asking the one participant to store all of this data in their own data system. So making sure that people are able to, one, capture this data and two, capture it in a safe and secure environment and be able to report back to DFSS as needed upon request. Some of the um, out, outputs and outcomes of the program is we want to be able to know for those who are eligible and who are 
in school that they're that we're seeing um, that they're completing high school if they're of that high school age. Once again, we know this is a short term intervention, three months of service and up to three months of follow up. And so if they're of that state of that age where they are eligible for high school, we want to be able to capture that if they're able to graduate. We want to know the percentage of young people, once again, who are interested or um, seeking employment. The age, once again, is 10 to 17, so that's not going to be a lot of youth, but we want to make sure that if they are at that stage where they're seeking employment, we're capturing that information. Some other things to point out is we want to be able to show the percentage of eligible individuals who exhibit improved social competencies. Once again, DFSS will work really closely with the one chosen delegate to ensure that we're able to create surveys and other ways to capture the information listed here. Next slide. Lastly, some additional things that are outputs that we want to make sure that the delegate is aware that they will need to capture and provide on an as need basis to the department. Um, those things can include the percentage of eligible employ employed um, staff, or excuse me, of youth who, who are eligible who complete high school, as we pointed out, number of individuals served by the population, we want to know how many actually engage in the evidence-based programming and how many um, actually engage in any kind of prevention or intervention services. Um, if you have to refer individuals to mental health services or treatment, we want to be able to capture that as well. And we want to be able to understand if there are any other trauma-informed services that a young person is going to be engaged with. Um, I want to get into the selection criteria and, and before I do that, I just want to make sure I answer the one question that's in the in the mailbox. Um, so I know you were looking for one provider. Is there an opportunity for a collaborative grant application with a primary provider? Um, yes, there's always an opportunity, and we strongly encourage individuals, particularly because we're only seeking one, that they if they want to apply, that they can apply um, under as you know in a collaborative grant process. The way that our grant process works, and Jillian will cover that a little bit under e-procurement, is you still have to list one person as the primary grant awardee. That is how the city works. So if you are going to have a subcontract relationship with someone, you have to be able to explain it in the RFP, but there is only one applicant who will be awarded for this grant. And then if you have a subcontract relationship with others, you'll have to be able to demonstrate or, or tell us what that looks like and what those services will be. But we can talk about, we can definitely get into more, if there are more questions about that, please feel free to follow up with us. Um, selection criteria. <laughs> Excuse me. There are five um, selection criteria that we look at and evaluate in order to determine whether or not someone will be able to get awarded. The way the system works is based on scoring. And so it is not a selection criteria that is subjective. It is based on you competing with everyone else who's applying for this grant um, opportunity. Um, the first area is community involvement. We want to know that the respondent provides details, evidence, or examples that demonstrates their understanding of the population um, they plan to serve and is specific about the strengths um, and assets, as well as challenges needed of the group, including serving partnerships available to assist them. I just want to stress here that being able to talk about and being once again clear about understanding um, the population of young girls, and in particular, young girls of, victim, of violence and trauma, and being able to show and demonstrate um, the strengths as well as challenges. And we will need to see both here. Um, the respondent also describes competencies, capacities, or the infrastructure that reflects the needs of girls who have been exposed to various levels of trauma, violence, or engagement in the justice system, and have these develop, developments impact youth. Um, once again, this is not a cop. This is we, the idea is we do not want participants who are currently doing programming that's not very gender um, gender um, responsive or just doing one kind of program to say we have a boys program or we have a program that's mixed. We can just go ahead and put this over here and make it just for girls. We want you to demonstrate that you have the competencies, capacities, and infrastructure and experience in order for you to be able to execute this. And that you have a full understanding and account and practices and policies related to DEI planning. Um, and it speaks to how the leadership reflects the population you're trying to serve here in this RFP. Next slide. 
Our next criteria is organizational capacity. We will be looking and reigning, um, ranking um, delegates based on can they providing us a recruitment and hiring plan as it relates to the staff and whether and who have lived experience and who are culturally competent and have a relevant work experience. So it, we need to be able to have respondents be able to demonstrate and show us how they are recruiting and hiring individuals, how they will be gender responsive and culturally competent. And you will need to provide the two job descriptions in, um, in this process. It is not optional, it's a requirement. It's a required, um, it's a requirement, a required upload for this um, for this grant application. Um, the respondent demonstrates a robust infrastructure around fiscal monitoring. Once again, anyone who's done business with the city understands that being able to stay on top of vouchering and any deletions, any kind of audits and internal reporting, what are your fiscal controls, how are you tracking, how are you maintaining and organizing, um, and what's in your, how is your organization structured in order for you to be able to meet the vouchering requirements. Um, the respondent gives a detailed account on how data is collected stored and entered into this and entered. Once again, there's a lot of data collection here. We wanna see people be able to demonstrate not just that you have a data system, um, but you need to be able to tell us how your data system is going to be able to allow you to meet all of the requirements that were previously shown on the other page um, and how that's stored and secured and how you train people on that. And then lastly, the respondent describes their current policies related to disclosures in the areas of human trafficking, domestic violence, gender-based violence, as well as homicidal and suicidal ideations for girls that they serve. What we know um, based on the research that we've done is that we want to be able to provide opportunities that if a young woman wants to disclose any of any 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 kind of disclosure, there needs to be a policy and a practice in place from the delegate in order to be able to address that and to know what next steps are. So we need respondents to be able to demonstrate and to show us that they have policies and procedures in place, and and be able to tell us what is what it looks like when they encounter these kind of incidents on site. Next slide. Strength of proposal, this um, this is really where we want to know, ultimately, can this delegate be able to execute the work that um, is being laid out here? Um, the respondent has to be able to demonstrate that they detail how girls will be served from enrollment to completion. How are they going to indicate or use the curriculum and build in program activities? Once again, this is individualized one-on-one -on -one services but you can at times do group as necessary. So if you are going to add groups at certain points in times, being able to describe what that looks like and what a client's journey will look like from start to finish of this programming. The respondent speaks to all three key subsets of this following of the questions um, and the information giving details and appropriateness as to the content of the RFP and populations to be served. That includes being able to clearly state how you will do not only recruitment, but capstone projects, one-on-one, -on -one, follow-up services, and transition planning. Um, respondents will be able to, will have to be able to tell us what is their current relationship with the Illinois Department of Juvenile Justice, Cook County Juvenile Probation, um, including working with probation officers in community, attending court, aftercare meetings, and any wraparound service planning. Once again, we're looking for someone who has experience working with young people, as well as an understanding of juvenile probation in court. Um, respondents detail the way in which partner agencies will participate. This is particularly important as we talk about transition planning and being able to connect young women to services as they transition after, after the end of three months from the one-on-one. -on -one. Respondents clearly outline a plan to provide follow-up services for girls, including their parents and guardians. Um, and we want to add some details about how you plan to collaborate with your community-based service partners on the area to ensure that there's a smooth transition in that plan. And lastly, that you demonstrate experience working with capstone projects um, and discuss a plan to support girls in the development and completion of their capstone projects. Once again, I wanna reiterate, all of these things are clearly laid out in the RFP and I strongly encourage people to read this section in particular so you and the questions on the application so you clearly are able to articulate and respond in a way that allows you us to rate you appropriately. Next slide. Um, our fourth criteria is performance management and outcomes. 
The biggest things here is we want to be able to know that you can demonstrate evidence or strong past performance against the desired outcomes. So once again, given the outcomes that we have listed here, what is your experience being able to demonstrate your ability to um, reach those outcomes and goals and have the and have the mechanisms in place in order to track those things? We also want to know that you have experience using data to inform or improve services. We know that um, because you're doing one on one work with young women that over time people need to have a flexibility about how performance, how what works, what's not working. How are you incorporating feedback from young people to to figure out what things maybe need to be different? What does communication look like? Do we have a cultural competent office? Are we getting feedback about how like from young people about that? And are we making changes based on the feedback we're getting? Um, those are some of the things that we're looking for in that section. In addition, we want to know that you have relative you have um, relevant systems and processes to collect, store, and analyze data. Break down da da how you disaggregate data. How do you break it down in specific ways? We also want to know that you have a clear history of working with girls in the justice system, including the number of youth you've served. So once again, if you've worked with programs in the past, we want to know what those numbers are, how you determine those numbers, how you collected that information. And then if you haven't in the past, we want to know how you are planning to do that and to meet the needs of this particular population and part of your responses. And our last criteria is a reasonable cost, budget justification, and leverage of funds. Um, there is a requirement of an in-kind um, match here, and there is an administrative um, there is an administrative um, limit per this per the federal part of this contract. Once again, that information is clearly outlined in the budget section of the RFP, as well as um, your budget instructions um, when you get to the responses part of your application. Um, we want to know that you have the fiscal capacity to implement the proposed budget. We want to know that you're able to leverage on any other funds or in-kind supports that allow us to have the most robust programming for young women. And then thirdly, the respondent needs to be able to demonstrate the reasonable implementation costs and fund requests related to services. Is your budget reasonable? Does it make sense? Given um, the amount of time and given the dollars you have, where are you putting the majority of your money and into what services? Next slide. And lastly, section criteria. We just want to once again just reiterate to everybody, and I cannot state this enough, start early, save often in the system. Um, there are several attachments. Please make sure before you submit your application that you have all of your attachments that you're able to make sure all of your attachments actually attach. Um, this oftentimes is a problem in the system. And be sure to attach your organizational budget, which is provided for you in this system. Please do not use any other budget form that unless the one that is in the RFP. Some of you may be current providers with the city. Do not use your currently awarded budget form to complete this. You need to use the budget form that is in the actual RFP and that is provided to you in order for us to be able to analyze your budget. Um, and please make sure all of the program requirements are addressed. Um, once again, you are required to have the job descriptions uploaded here, as well as a multitude of other things as an attachment. Please make sure whoever is finalizing and sending the RFP off understands all of the attachments that must be attached in order for us to, to view your and evaluate your contract fully. Um, budget cost. Um, budget or cost proposals. Once again, the term of this contract is ideally we'd like to execute this contract from July 1 of this year through September of 2025. Um, this is a federal grant. If we decide to extend the grant, we will let the grantee know, but that is the terms as of right now. The amount of the award is $275,000. The administrative cost will be capped at 15% per application. Um, and then individual agencies or subcontractors to lead agencies must be able to demonstrate a minimum 15% in-kind match. This goes back to the question earlier about being able to have collaborators of subcontractors as you apply for this. Um, and then please submit a budget for 14 months of service. Um, once again, it's for the life of the contract. So we want your budgets to reflect 14 months of service. Um, cost categories or are, are definitions are attached as part of the budget's instructions in every RFP. 
So once again, please review the budget instructions that come with the RFP, as well as use the budget form that is attached with this RFP. Um, and be thoughtful and inclusive when developing your budgets. Once again, apply your program's actual cost. Um, and then keep in mind, uh, we cannot give you more money than what you asked. So we know this is a grant, it's federal, this is the money, this is the money we got. And so we know it's 275. So in some ways we make it easy for you. Um, so just try to think about what is a reasonable budget that we can put together given the dollars that are already there. Um, some common errors that we just wanna flag for people, mistakes individuals make is being able to calculate fringe um, and supplies um, fringe. Once again, um, you're using a budget form that's provided for you in the RF, please, please make sure that you're checking the fringe um, and that we understand clearly what is the, what is the full ask of someone's salary. Um, and the salaries should be reasonable. We, we understand that this may be someone who's also carrying some additional costs, but we've left enough um, in regards to having full-time staff as it relates to advocates. A program manager can be part-time. And we wanna make sure that the salary is reasonable so that we ensure that there is a turnover in the position. Um, supplies, these are often under or over budgeted. Once again, one of the, some of the supplies on here is going to be able, is being able to, to, to actually purchase the curriculum, which I encourage people to seek and review prior to you submitting their application. And what are some of the client assistances? What are some of the things we know that young women might need in order for you to be able to um, appropriately uh, like do services for young, for young women in services here? And then just make sure that your job description titles and your job description upload have the same title. We don't wanna be seeking app att attachments here. So if you have an attachment, please make sure that it's clearly labeled as job description um, so that we're able to match that when we get to that section of the budget to ensure that we're looking at, this, at, the, at the job description as part of that question. Um, also put a brief description of the job in the, in the budget document itself. Um, so we can, once again, able to look at the job description and what you've identified in the budget as um, responsibilities here. Um, and put your budget in the appropriate columns. Once again, please look at the budgets. They have different columns, they have different titles. Um, some is for your match, some is for what the city, what you'd like the city to ask. Just make sure that you take time to review those things. Um, and then uh, your pre-proposal webinar is today. Um, if you've got um, questions, from this, please be able to submit those to us and um, Jillian and myself or your contacts. Um, you're more than welcome to ask and email questions up and uh, um, throughout the process here. If there's particular things, um, know that we will, applications are due June 4th at, um, at noon. And I wanna be clear, it is at noon. The machine shuts down at noon. So it's not up until noon, it's before noon. And so if you are in the middle of uploading a document and it is 11.59 and the clock turns 12, the machine will not let you upload the rest of that application and it is a non-submission. So start early, save often. I strongly urge people to start uploading at least 24 hours before the cutoff time. So in case you run into any technology or issues that you're able to be able to resolve those quickly. Do not wait to the last minute and unfortunately, once the machine closes, there's nothing we can do in order for us to accept your application. We will not take applications that are not submitted through the system and, we're, and there is no appeal process um, for this. Um, so once again, start early, be on time, put your things in as quickly as possible, save your work. Um, this system is an Oracle system. Sometimes that is a little wonky. I encourage people to think about if you're going to um, be able to do this, think about knowing what your home base sort of web system is. Is it Google? Are you using Firefox? All of those things make a difference about how you upload, how long it takes. So just start early, save often, test to make sure that you actually don't need some technical assistance. Um, we are available to help support you up until 24 hours before the closing of this. We cannot really do much before on the day of, because at that point, you aren't gonna have enough time in order to really address some of the technical issues. So we just wanna be transparent and honest. 
So start early. If you don't have an iSupplier account, that will be the next part of this is Jillian will help you figure out how to how to work through iSupplier. But I just want to stress with people to start start early, saved often, and make sure that you um, try to upload sooner before sooner rather than later as well. At that point, I think I'm going to address any questions that are in the Q&A box um, as well. And I'll, before I jump into the evaluation process, can the one who is over the program be a part of each position? Um, if you're asking if one person can carry two titles, um, uh, no, they cannot. So the way we've worked out the budget is we want to be responsive to young women and their needs. And so if you're going to say that you want to have somebody serve as a program manager and an advocate, you need to be able to justify how you're going to be able to complete the needs of young young women in the program and be able to do all of the other requirements. So if that's your structure, you have to be able to justify why that instead of hiring individuals for that role, you think that this is something somebody could split between those two roles. Um, and then that will be evaluated. Um, I, want, I do want to say we've laid out the staffing pattern based on past experiences that we know so I strongly suggest that you um, potentially adhere to the staffing pattern. If not, once again, you have to justify um, where you think young women are still going to be able to get the level of service they need if, if you're having someone serve in two roles um, for the program. Um, could you please clarify what does a collaborative look like and how attached attached would, would the big organization be if I'm a smaller nonprofit that is the perfect programming but not a large organization. So applications for us are not based on size. Um, this is based on your responses to the questions and how you answer to them. So it doesn't matter if you're a small organization or a large organization. We're trying to figure out who's got the best experience and understanding of how to work with young um, women in particular. And so size isn't so much an issue here. If you choose to work in a collaborative, that is a question you're gonna to have to deal with internally about who's gonna be the lead, who's gonna serve as the fiscal agent, who's gonna be responsible. That means who is going to put their name down as the lead and be responsible for all things related to this contract. So whoever is listed as the person who applies for this, they get the award letter, they get the dollars, they're responsible for all of the um, data requirements, the meetings, ensuring all of the deliverables get met. However those things get met, that's between that individual and if they have subcontractors, um, I strongly and you know you know suggest that they have MOUs in place to ensure that there's some accountability across the board. But how that structure looks, we won't. We are the city itself isn't going to necessarily tell you how that structure looks. But those are just things that I know you should consider um, before entering any kind of collaborative um, to figure out who's going to be taking the lead, who's going to be leading that effort. We're not making that call. That is a call you'll have to make before you submit your um, documentation and as supplier. Um, but I strongly encourage if you have the performance and the experience, um, once again, we're not looking at size of organization, we're looking at experience and we're looking at individuals who have um, experience working with the population, has experience with performance and outcome measures similar to the ones in this RFP. That is what we're looking at. I strong, you know, then that's what we want to um, have applicants bring to the table here. Um, I, evaluation process. Um, so I'll jump back into the deck. Um, once again, we're going to evaluate on the strength of the proposal and the responsiveness to the selection criteria. This is not about the size or small. We want to know that people understand the community area, that they understand young people, particularly young women, the challenges and the assets and the um, related to that. That is what we're going to be looking at. Failure to submit a complete proposal or respond fully to all of the requirements makes your submission subject to rejection, i.e. if you're uploading in the middle and the system cuts off, we're not going to be able to take that submission as a whole submission. Um, the commissioner, up, um, upon review of the recommended agencies, may reject, deny, or recommend agencies that have applied for grants based on previous performance and or areas needed. Um, once again, that's a last resort. And if for some reason we're unable to reach any kind of agreement based on the review of the process. So I want to be clear that um, that is a last resort person. It is not the first point. It is upon the department. It is upon myself and the team to be able to review um, um, objectively all of the submissions and be able to make those recommendations to leadership. 
Um, DFSS reserves the right to ensure that all mandated services are available available citywide and provided in a linguistic and culturally appropriate manner. So once again, we are talking about young women who need to be served across the city. And so your responses should reflect um, your ability to serve citywide and that you're able to think about the linguistic and culturally appropriate manner in which some of those services will need to be um, delivered. That's it. Um, any other burning questions before we move into the I procurement um, response, please make sure that you can put that into the chat. Um, once again, applications are due June 4th at noon and um, save, start early, save often. Like I said, if you can try to upload at least 24 hours in advance. So you're not waiting for the last minute. Um, submissions do take some time. I give yourself at least a two hour window to make sure that you, if you run into any crashes or anything like that, that you're able to get your submission in. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and look at the rest of the mailbox here to see, make sure that I've answered all questions. Um, answer that um, answer that um I think somebody just put like maybe this would be in regards to space and location. I don't know. I miss, I don't know exactly what you're referring to. It might be referring to the collaboration. Um, either way, if you're you all of those things you'll need to consider as you put together your budget. So um, and making sure that that's part of your explanation about how your budget's put together. If you are going to do a collaborative and people are going to put dollars up front, that would count towards your budget as your in kind or your. Um, in kind match, um, you need to be able to clearly articulate that on the budget as well as explain it um, as well. Um, so once again, those are collaborative questions you'll have to work out if you're interested in um, working with someone on this project. Those are things that you'll have to work out individually. The city itself won't deem that. Once again, we will only award to the person who puts in their application and I supplier and to them, if you wanna have a collaborative relationship around that, um, you'll need to work those things out and be able to truly articulate in the application questions how that structure will look. Any other questions? I think this is me. Yes, yeah, start early, <laughs> save often. <laughs> I can't say it enough. Um, if you've done business with the city, um, you know um, we require a lot of paperwork. Um, so you need to register for iSupplier and e-procurement now to start early and Jillian's gonna um, review that with you. And then review the RFP narrative and application questions closely. Once again, this, R this webinar cannot serve as the only way that you learn about this RFP. It is your responsibility as an applicant in order to read the entire RFP, that you understand the scope, you understand the selection criteria, you understand the application questions fully. If you're working together as a team, make sure that you all understand what the ultimate goal is so you're all answering the questions in a way that is coherent and it makes sense. As someone who reads many of these, it becomes apparent that different people worked out different parts and they're not linked together. So just make sure that you take a read before you submit um, or have somebody who's external read so that they you know exactly what you are responding to um, there's a 4,000 character limit for each question, um, not the entire RFP, for each question in the RFP, um, and that you want to include punctuation and space. Um, what I strongly suggest people do is to type out your responses, do a word count on Word, and then you can cut and paste into this section. Um, and then lastly, do not use the back button on your browser. Once again, our system is a little wonky, it's Oracle. <laughs> and so we already know that's one of the issues that creates a challenge. So as you're saving your work or if you're putting it directly into there, just make sure that you're not using the back button on your browser. And on that, I think I'm turning it over to you, Jillian. All right, thanks, Lisa. Just a few tips for working in e-procurement. Again, we can't stress this enough. Save often and submit early. To submit multiple applications in a single RFP, applicants will need to set up a unique user account in iSupplier. The e-procurement system is not capable of submitting more than one distinct proposal per associated email address. Therefore, you must use a separate email address for each submittal proposal. You can submit your application and amend it up until the due date, 
of June 4th, 2024, before 12 noon. Avoid the rush and possible mishaps by submitting early. Plan on submission taking approximately 30 to 60 minutes. Please be advised that late applications will not and cannot be accepted. For questions, please make use of the e-procurement hotline at 312-744-4357. Please note that the hotline operates during business hours only, Friday through Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. Again, save often and submit early. New agency requirements. Um, the agency now, now requires um, agencies to provide articles of incorporation and any amended ar articles of incorporation and IRS affirmation letter. This is for non-for-profit agencies only. This, this letter must be dated within 60 days of submittal. You can call you can obtain this by calling the IRS directly at 1-877-829-5500. If you are a for-profit agency, please submit your original letter from the IRS showing your FEIN number. And next is, um, we now require a, DUN, a DUNS number as well as a central contractor registration. Um, provide a copy of the entity overview page on the www.sam.gov website. And lastly, we require a certificate of good standing um, letter with the state of Illinois. For technical assistance, there's a link on the DFSS webpage to the RFP of interest and training documents under, uh, under alerts. Please check under the alerts section. For questions on registration and e-procurement technical assistance for delegate agencies, please reach out to customer support at cityofchicago.org or their help desk at 312-744-4357. And then here at the bottom is the link to the training materials. They contain documents and videos. Answering responses and accepting amendments. To enter a response, step one, you have to create a quote from the drop down menu in the actions box and click on the go. This will take you to the application page where you can get started. If the RFP you are interested in has been amended, you will need to acknowledge and accept the amendment to start and submit a response. To accept the amendment, click on view amendment history. Here. Step two. To begin the acceptance and acknowledgement process, follow these steps after clicking view amendment history. Click on the document number, click on the infinity or eyeglasses icon to review the amendment changes to the RFP. Click on the acknowledge amendments button to acknowledge receipt and understanding of these changes and proceed. By acknowledging the amendment, you are indicating that you are aware of the changes being made to the RFP in the amendment. Step three, when you get to this screen, click on the I accept checkbox and then click on acknowledge. Once you've done that, click on yes to indicate that you confirm your acknowledgement of the amendment. Finally, Click on the checkbox that you accept the terms and conditions and then click on accept to actually accept them. This is the final step in acknowledging and accepting the amendment. Now we're going to go into how to submit an application. Now, when you are ready to submit, start by saving your draft one last time and then click continue. If you are missing information, the system will give you an error message at the top of the page. It's extremely helpful for applicants. Usually the error message um, directs to something left undone in the application. Um, in the last example, the error message indicated that the line found under the lines tab had not been completed. In this example that you see here, the error is about an unanswered question in the application or requirements 
section. The quote value refers to your, in this case, missing answer. Once the application is free from errors, you are ready to proceed and submit. At this point, clicking continue should put your application into the review and submit phase. When you get to this page, this is your last chance to review all of your data and confirm that it's accurate. Check your attachments and scroll to the bottom of the screen to see all of your responses. At the bottom of the screen, you will be asked to provide an electronic signature. Please be sure to fill in the signature before checking the box. And then finally, you can click submit down at the bottom. Please make sure that this submittal con that you see this submittal confirmation screen. The e-procurement system will send a confirmation email within 24 hours of your submission. You can please call and email me if you desire confirmation prior to then. Any questions? Is the application printable to write out before submitting? You can probably print it out for your use, but we need it submitted within the e-procurement system. Yeah, to Jillian's point, you can print out the application, but all you can, you, you, it just prints out the questions um, for you. So if you're trying to share it among the team, like a divide and conquer, yes, you can, but all app, all the questions and all the updates have to be in a procurement. Once again, we don't take anything handwritten. Everything has to come through the system in order for it to be considered as a submission to us. Did you say that DUNS is required? Yes, a DUNS number is required. <coughs> but that concludes the end of our questions. Um, just wanna point out for more information um, regarding program questions, please reach out to Lisa Hampton. Her information is here um, is below as well. Um, and for non-programmatic questions, you can reach out to the e-procurement hotline. Um, they're open Monday through Friday, nine, nine through five, or you can also send them an email. And please, please feel free to send me an email, Jillian Black. Um, my email is jillian.black at cdfchicago.org. Great, thank you. Is there any, I don't think there's any more questions. Is there, let me see. Oh. I believe that's all. Perfect. Awesome, everyone. Thank you very much for your time today. And once again, if you have any additional questions, please reach out to us. We will also post an amendment, as Jillian already stated, um, for this. Um, good luck. Take your time. Um, and good luck to those of you who will be applying. Um, and we look forward to working with that delegate agency once it gets chosen. And thank you today, Jillian, for organizing our webinar. No problem. Everyone have a Good rest of your day.